Welcome back to another episode of techtalk.travel. Uh, it's our final episode for season two and for this year, and I'm thrilled to uh, invite or have on the show Mr. Rico de Blanc. Rico, thank you for being on the show. That's great. Good morning, Andre, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. For those of you who don't know Rico, Rico is, um, I would consider, one of the um, elite hospitality professionals we have in the industry today. Um, Rico and I first met uh, in Tokyo uh, yeah. when we were, or when you were opening the Ritz-Carlton Tokyo. I think that was back in 2006? 2007, 2008, yeah. and um, I remember you visiting the hotel regularly making sure that everything was going well because when you open a hotel you only open once Correct. and uh, your involvement was crucial to a, a successful opening yeah no well thank you i mean it was fantastic it's yeah i fell in love with that property actually oh it's beautiful yeah, yeah yeah it's still yeah. today one of my favorite hotels yeah um during my time in asia i used to go back there as often as i could it's a wonderful yeah. property in fact the systems manager Didi sedu is still there today, yeah. uh, who opened the hotel, and uh, we still chat regularly on Skype. He's a, a wonderful... I remember yeah. Didi walking into the office in 2006, and uh, 2005 maybe, and he said to me, uh, I want to work here. And I said, what do you want to do? I said, I know everything about IT. I, everything, I can, I can tell you. I said, I said, I know nothing about IT. He said, good, hire me then, and I hired him. Yeah, no, he's a wonderful, wonderful yeah. guy. And he is very knowledgeable, so he is, yeah. the fact that he's still there is an achievement for him as well. Okay, so Rico, to get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about your background, first of all, um, as I do with all our guests. Absolutely. And I think your background um, is particularly industry interesting because yeah. you've come from, um, first of all, Europe. Yeah. You're a European hotelier who lives and works now in Asia right. and who spent many years in Asia. Um, and your role today is as CEO of Sun Hung Kai Properties, right. based in Hong Kong. Right. Um, but before we talk about what you're doing currently today, I'd like to learn a little bit about your journey yeah. from, from graduating hotel school to where you are today. And, and what was it about the industry that um, drove you to want to focus specifically on the luxury end of the market? Um, because there is a difference between operating a, a luxury property versus a, a yeah. budget property. So I'd like to understand what your motivations were. So we go back a long time. I think um, at a very young age, I was motivated to go into the hotel business for a few reasons. One of them, I enjoyed the hospitality. I enjoyed serving people. I enjoyed hearing people say thank you when I gave them something. So that was one. So it, it came natural to me. Uh, two, there was this TV series back then on, on the, uh, in Holland that I was watching called Hotel. Mm -hmm. And this general manager lived in the hotel and he drove this Porsche 911 and he had this luxury life. And it was a luxury hotel in San Francisco. And I thought, wow, I would like that kind of lifestyle. Um, so I wanted to be a general manager at a very young age. Um, so subsequently, I, I did my boarding school um, in the UK, uh, moved to Holland to one of the best hotel schools, Hotel School The Hague. And I basically joined three companies in my career. I started out with Disney, so the Walt Disney Company, both in uh, Orlando and in Paris. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company, which uh, allowed me to travel to many different countries, um, and ending up in Japan, in Tokyo, um, and Sanunkai Properties, um, for which I look after all the hotels. Um, I've worked for the last 10 years. Um, and due to some health reasons, I've just left them mm -hmm. um, recently. Um, and uh, I'm in Amsterdam today, um, and uh, I'm taking a little break on my career. Okay. So looking back, I've done three major uh, jobs, I think, and um, all of them with lots of passion, all of them with a lot of uh, enthusiasm. That, that I can vouch for. Yeah. Uh, I certainly have um, very strong memories of your commitment and dedication in the time that and it was very limited time that we spent um, in Tokyo, but I could get a strong sense from your professionalism and mm. dedication to the industry and, and to serving the guests at the end of the day. I think for you, um, the key was making sure the guests felt at home yeah. during their stay and that they felt attended to. Yeah, and you, so somehow, you know, in any hotel or just let's say um, Tokyo, where we both met, um, we had 600 employees. How do you get every single employee to be fully committed mm. all the time, 
even when they walk through a public area, even if they um, are, are a little bit tired having worked for eight hours. And, and how do you get them still to keep that sparkle in their eyes? So that was the trick. Mm. Because as a customer you, you, you or a guest, you want to have that feeling that you're wanted, that you're welcome, that uh, you're not at home, you're, you're being pampered somewhere else. And constantly inspiring and motivating people to give customers that feeling, um, that's, that's a lot of work. Yeah, it is, it is. And it takes um, a lot of dedication and effort. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the technology that was associated to, um, let's say, the opening of a Ritz-Carlton Tokyo sure. type of property. Sure. Uh, there's a high level of demand required for such a property like that when it comes to the technology. Um, from your experience, uh, pre-opening and then even after the property was open, how did you find, well, how was your experience with the technology at the time and where did it perhaps feel that you, where did you feel that it perhaps let you down? Yeah. And where did it um, surprise you and where, where you thought, wow, I didn't expect that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure there must, there must have been some examples um, given the, the requirements that a property like that has. When you open a hotel, you, you want to have the latest of the greatest and you want to have the best technology. But the trick is, Andre, to keep it simple. And the trick is not to be influenced by people like yourself who are coming with these wonderful ideas that is the latest of gadgets, but still I, I look at a customer that just comes for one night, that are maybe a little bit older or need glasses, and, and, and without glasses you can't read things. The little buttons of on or off. Um, biggest complaint in the hotel today? It's the size of the shampoo bottle. You don't know if it's shampoo or shower gel. And when you're in the shower, you don't wear your glasses. So people always go, oh, I can't read this um, as an example. So you keep it simple. And that's with technology, the same thing. When you and I met back then, I always said, no, let's not do that. You came with, um, uh, you came with an idea to give me this digital phone. And this phone, I forgot the brand of it. Um, Avaya. Thank you, Avaya, which is a great phone. I mean, it was wonderful, this quality was very good, but you know what, you could launch a space shuttle with it. That's it had, true. <laughs> it had more buttons than, than you can imagine. Yep. And, and I was thinking, do we want to have an office feeling or do we want to have a hotel luxury environment? And with, which was much cheaper. The, the other phone that normally is much cheaper, the Avaya phone that you subscribe was a lot more expensive. I said, let's go for the cheaper model, less buttons, easy to use and you know make a few uh, pre-recorded buttons for room service and housekeeping and um, do you remember we put one button in there at the opening they took it away now after I left I put one button in there that said general manager mm -hmm. because I said every customer that comes in should be able to have access to me so we put in a button says general manager and everyone said, oh, you're crazy. Everybody said, don't do it, don't do it, because everybody will be calling you. And my secretary was, at the time, going, don't, don't. It's going to be horrible. I'm going to be overwhelmed with telephone calls. In the first year, I got three calls. Yeah. Two of them were misdialed. One of them wanted to say thank you for a wonderful stay. Yeah. It wasn't effective, therefore, but I wanted to try something new with technology try and do something innovative that nobody else does. Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't work, then change it slowly around. Mm -hmm. and it's a good philosophy, keep it simple. It, it works every time. But you're right, they weren't really appropriate phones for a hotel. They were yeah. an office phone at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. And one of the biggest challenges we had was trying to set the menu on the screen so that it was functional and easy to use for the guests. So, so as you said, they could actually see it. So that, 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 that goes back now yeah. some time. And today's debate about telephones is whether or not there even should be a phone in the room. I just opened a hotel in, um, in Hong Kong, Hotel Vic on the harbour. And because of the law, we needed to have one phone in the room. And I placed that phone, small one, beside the desk. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think anybody uses it. No. Because you don't use the, pho the phones anymore. You have your mobile phone, you have a tablet, you, there's many other ways to get information if exactly. you want to. I think the only rare area where hotels feel they need to have it is just purely from a security perspective. Correct. If a guest needs help and needs to contact the Correct. desk urgently, yeah. 
Um, there needs to be a method of doing that. And it's funny you mentioned that I stayed at a hotel in um, Hamburg just last week where there was no phone in the room. They used a tablet. Yeah. And I needed to contact the reception because the heating in the room wasn't working. Right. And I had to dial out, out and using my phone, I had to dial the hotel, hotel's phone number yeah. and go through their, their recordings before I could speak to a person. It took like three steps before I could actually speak to somebody. So there's, even today, the technology is not uh, frictionless or seamless in that sense. Yeah. So it's great having a, a, a tablet in the room, but mm. how effective is it? What is it really doing? Yeah. Is it just looking pretty yeah. or is it actually really providing assistance to the guest? You see, adding a tablet adds complications. Cleanliness, is it really clean? Mm. Um, breakdowns, um, which result in inefficiencies. Um, is a tablet user friendly? Because not everybody has a tablet at home. Mm. Um, so I think for me, luxury is about keeping it as simple as possible so that you can enjoy the surroundings as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't know, SHKP is essentially a management company for properties. No, it, um, Sonokai Properties is, uh, I think, world's largest property developer. Okay. And 10% um, of the company was hotels. And we had 27 beautiful hotels. Four Seasons Hong Kong, Ritz-Carlton Hong yeah. Kong, W Hong Kong, Ritz-Carlton Shanghai. Great properties. properties. Some others we also managed ourselves under different names. And uh, the company is wonderful, great quality. People that you work with, very professional. But we only operate in Hong Kong and China. Mm. Um, so many people in Europe or the United States are not quite familiar with it. And um, so 90% was, was residences that we, we buy land, we build residences and we sell, or office towers or shopping malls um, or various other parts of the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So what would a typical day look like for you in, in that role? What was it that you would do in a typical day? Because obviously you were representing the company from the hotel side. Yes. So talk me through a little bit about what that involved. Um, so we have to manage the asset. We have to manage the real estate. We have to make sure that we maximize the profit per square foot, which is very different than running a hotel mm. where your customer needs are always put at the forefront. Um, when land comes up for tender, we are going to find out, okay, is this a location where we want to have a hotel? So we start with the end in mind. We try and say, okay, we can build a hotel, this is going to be the revenues, and then work your way back to find out how much we can offer for that land to buy it. Um, so a basic day, a week for me was uh, Monday to Friday or Saturday, um, six days a week. I would uh, travel one or two days off the week, going into China, Singapore or Japan, or mostly in the area. Um, the hotels that I visited uh, during the week mostly are in Hong Kong, um, where we build a great rapport with the management companies. Um, and of course we want to make sure that these hotels are run well. Mm -hmm. Once a month we do uh, formal meetings with, with each hotel, uh, which worked very well. Um, and then once every quarter we either have a meeting with the management company themselves. Once a year we do the budgets. Um, so it was a very well-oiled machine. You know, you know, doing it for 10 years, you become very used to um, working with the, the same people. Very low turnover, yeah. um, lot of trust. Yeah. You know, when you have trust between people, you don't need to micromanage. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially the general managers. Yeah. Um, you know, they always tell me, "Leave me alone." I said, "Okay, you do your job. I'll leave you alone." Um, so that works very well. Mm -hmm. Good, good. And I'm sure with that role, you would have also then maintain that connection to your Ritz-Carlton colleagues yes. as well as Marriott colleagues as well. So yes. that would have also, um, I think, perhaps also helped in many ways when it came to certain discussions about budgets and, yes. and, and that. So that's but also, you know, like you said, Andre, I, I also went out traveling to find out what are other people doing, what are other companies doing, how can I learn more, yeah. what can I implement in my next hotel. Yeah. Yeah. So I always try to find out what is good and what is not so good and take the good and run with that. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Exactly. Yeah, good, good. Okay. I'd like to touch a little bit now. You obviously have spent many, many years in Asia. Yeah. You would have seen the um, evolution yeah. of the Asian traveler, specifically the Chinese traveler, I think. Uh, traditionally, the Chinese traveler has always been that, that group traveler where they've gone in, in a secure group of people uh, with, a, with a tour, if you like, and kind of followed a flag. Through the last 10 years, that's definitely changed with them becoming you know, more independent, better educated, yep. earning more money. 
um, they're starting to, to reach out on their own and, 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 and experience their own personalized experiences. Yep. And a lot of the younger generation are looking for that. They all use a platform called WeChat, yes. which I'm sure you're aware of. Yes. And that's an ecosystem where essentially they can book their entire um, travel experience from flights to hotels to taxis to trains, literally everything, tickets to yep. concerts and everything. Um, what's your take on, on WeChat and, and how do you see that potentially creeping into the Western market and what, yeah. what kind of influence do you think that may have on this market? I think it'll have a huge influence, but it will have influence once we get rid of the standard old school payment systems that still exist. Mm. So if, if you talk about WeChat, they take out the banking part, they take out the credit card, they take out the commission side, everything goes through WeChat or a similar platform and of course there's a lot of resistance in the West because you know these people want to survive they still want to to operate as they did 100 years ago um, but it's, it's it's changing slowly I think in Europe because a the, the Chinese are going to Europe and they want to use their WeChat payment also in uh, in Europe or the United States or elsewhere um, and I think also domestic travel I think the um, the, 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 the Chinese are enormous uh, powerful domestically. Mm. Um, and I'll give you an example. I was just reading an article about um, the number of Chinese that go abroad, the hundreds of millions that go abroad. And each one spends about 1,200 US dollars abroad. That's about a trillion dollars leaving China. And they're trying to keep that inside of China. They're trying now to promote domestic travel as much as possible, and WeChat will help them with that. Yeah. Um, I see um, a lot of new technology coming out in the next few years again. Um, because of that domestic travel. Mm. Um, but yeah, like you said, they're a very powerful group. Mm, mm, they are indeed. Um, moving on to management companies a little bit now. So yeah. companies like Marriott, so the World yeah. IHG, Starwoods. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently in Europe about, well, amongst people that I uh, discussed this topic with, about the relevance of management companies today. Yeah. Are they purely just a, a, a reward program? And a distribution platform for hotels, right? Um, or are they more? Are they are they able to offer the hotel owners more than that? And I give you an example with, you know, the likes of Airbnb coming into the marketplace, booking all of the major OTAs. They're all looking potentially. Well, let's just say there would be nothing from stopping them to acting as a management company by hotels literally removing themselves from the major platforms and just saying, well, I'm just going to have everything going through these OTAs. We don't really need a rewards program anymore because the next generation don't see the value so much in that. You may disagree, and I'd like to get your input on that because I think it's, um, it's a very interesting topic, and I think there are certain areas where hotels see value from being in a, in a chain environment or a yeah. management company. But I think also there's great advantages to being independent as well. Um, so I'd like to get your take on that. And once you've answered that, I'll come in with another um, no, yeah. set around another area that's related. So purely what I'm going to tell you is my opinion and my opinion please, only. Please. Um, I think we're going to go back to non-loyalty programs as it was 20 years ago. Because like you said, the younger generation is not looking for that. So 20 years ago, there was no loyalty program. Somebody came up with the idea, let's put in a point system and let's have loyalty. And customers there were starting to choose hotels because of that reason. Now, from a luxury perspective, that is the silliest thing you can come up with because people should be choosing your hotel because of the experience that the hotel is offering and the people that work there, but not because of the points they can receive. For example, if you um, want to go to a fine dining restaurant in France, in the middle of nowhere, there's three-star Michelins, they don't have a point system and they're booked every day of the week for months ahead. Why is that? Because they are that good. Now, and I think we've become diluted in having too many hotels belonging to one brand that you will not be able to deliver that type of excellence on a daily basis. And therefore, you need to have something else to lure customers. Mm -hmm. In the future, maybe even starting 
as soon as we're talking right now, customers are not looking for that anymore. Um, and like you maybe just mentioned, I don't think that's going to be in the next 10 years the focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your take on the, the, the large chains having so many different brand, brands today and so many different types of properties even within that brand and, and also even in certain areas almost competing against each other. Yeah. Now many hoteliers and CEOs of these companies say it's only a good thing, it only drives competition, it keeps us on our toes, it's, it's only a good thing. Yes, perhaps it is, but is there, a, is there another effect that's, that's perhaps happening that we're not seeing? I think it's, it's okay, it, it's, it's not good or bad. Um, I think they need to grow and the way they can only grow is by having more brands in, in more cities. Mm. You know, I'm, we're here in the middle of Amsterdam and there's a Marriott hotel next door, which means they cannot have a, a second Marriott within a certain range. So having multiple brands allows you to still expand in a city like Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, so I understand why a company like Marriott uh, buys more brands or comes up with new uh, brands con continuously. As long as they keep investing in those brands and hotels, because quite often, and it's not specifically Marriott, Quite often, they're actively trying to sell the brand to an owner. The owner buys into it. They get great support to the opening. And then after the opening, they're left on their own because those people are working on the next, uh, you know, trying to s s sign up the next hotel. Yeah. Um, so as long as there is a good corporate support uh, for each hotel, I, I think it, each company can uh, continue to, to extend in more brands if they do it well. Yeah, You would have no doubt recently seen the news about the data breach uh, from, from Starwood right. and uh, their preferred, uh, uh, Starwood preferred program. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get your take on that and um, the way that that's been handled because some people are saying, you know, this is taking far too long to get any feedback. The whole migration of Starwood into Marriott has been a shambles. Yeah. Um, obviously there's keyboard critics out there that have the opinions of the world that think what they say is yeah. the right thing. Um, but what's your take on, first of all, protection of data? I know for a fact how seriously Marriott take the, the security of their data. Right, right, right. Um, they, do, they do take it extremely seriously. Um, but these things are going to happen inevitably at some point or another. Yeah. And I think it's the way it's handled um, prior and, and after. Yeah. It's the second largest data breach behind Yahoo's. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a big deal. So are you talking about the integration of the SPG program into the Merit Rewards or the hacking pro, uh, that the hacking, happened last week? The hacking that happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I read the same thing as everybody else in the newspaper. Um, I am trusting Marriott has the smartest people in the industry to deal with that. Yeah. And, and I understand if you're talking about 500 million people, uh, that yes, there are always some uh, mistakes that are made. How do you minimize that and learn from that? I trust that Marriott does a great job to, yeah. to fix that. Um, of course, it, you know, there's news that this comes out and they have to probably you know, uh, announce it, um, that there was a breach made. Um, but again, um, I have a great relationship with Marriott, um, the CEO himself or some other executives, and uh, I, I, I've not spoken to him or, or, or them about it, but I'm, I'm assuming they will look very well after it. Yes, no now, doubt. just to go back to what happened a few years ago when they integrated uh, Marriott Reward, Ritz-Carlton Reward and SPG, I was a little bit concerned about that time because at the time we owned two, two, two Ritz-Carlton hotels uh, under the Marriott brand and we had a separate uh, loyalty program with a separate uh, benefit program which, which meant that you were treated differently as a customer and now having it integrated I think you're going to be diluting your brand slightly. Mm. And it's the same thing, Andre, with, um, for example, Volkswagen and Bentley. Mm -hmm. You see, if you are a Bentley driver, you enjoy this luxury and the brand itself is the ultimate level of a driving experience. And when you ask or say to Volkswagen drivers, hey, you can now also drive a Bentley, they're going to be very happy. But this Bentley driver will, you know, you look at each other, you see another Bentley, and then the driver is not who you are. Over time, this Bentley driver is going to change brands. Mm. He or she 
will change to Aston Martin, Rolls-Royce, something else, if that would happen. But luckily enough, they didn't do that. With uh, Marriott and Ritz-Carlton, I was very worried to see them integrating the loyalty programs and closing the corporate office of Ritz-Carlton in the United States and therefore not having the segregation anymore of a separate brand as it was set up in the past. Yeah. Now, the future will only tell if they're going to keep it separate or are they going to have people that have little knowledge about luxury run a luxury company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Talking about luxury, as a general manager, to run a luxury type <coughs> hotel such as the Ritz Carlton Tokyo, what does it take to be a general manager in a property like that? What, what does one need to be? So if you're yeah. sitting down with a student now whose aspirations is to be you know, the, one of the best GMs in the world, one of the leading luxury hotels, what would be some of the advice well, that you could give them? I refer to the following scenario, and if you're a student of a hotel school and you want to be a general manager, picture this, you're working in a circus, and there's always this person that has a stick with a plate on it, and he spins that plate, and with this spinning, he has another stick, and he spins that, and then a third, and a fourth, and at one time, he or she has ten plates going on, making sure they don't fall down. That's the same thing being a general manager of a luxury hotel. Each plate represents a part of the business that you have to make sure it doesn't break down. You have your guests, your employees, your owners, your technology, whatever it is in your hotel. You constantly are making, if one does break down, it means you have probably a complaint or you have something you have to rework, you have a defect and that takes not only time but money to fix. So it's an extremely busy period. Now, you cannot do that alone. So my job is always to make sure I hire the smartest people around me. So you gotta have a team that is not only smarter than you, but they are helping you run that part of the business. Because that's, that's the middle management that is going to bear and work with throughout the organization and all the other employees. Um, so that's a little bit what I, what I look for when I run a luxury hotel. Yeah. Do you see that there's also a, a need for them to be very cognizant of managing the relationship between the hotel owners and the yeah. management company? What's the dynamic of the GM in that relationship? Yeah, yeah well, I, I, you know, I've, I've been a hotel manager and I've been an owner, so I, I, I see both sides. And um, yeah, as, an, as a manager, you have to have a good relationship with the owner. But as an owner, you also have to have a good relationship with your manager. Mm -hmm. I think um, having a good relationship with the manager means that a lot of trust. You need to let them do the work, and we spoke about that earlier. Um, I think he or she needs to also know what the expectation is. Um, what, is the, what is the owner looking for? Uh, not owner, all owners have hotel background like myself. Some owners have very little background or little education or experience and therefore you have to adjust your style to that person. Um, and that's not always the case that people are successful in doing that. Um, so managing the management company for me is easier because I've been in that position before. I know what they're looking for. And I give them off the more leeway because of that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that um, a lot of your time historically has been um, educating owners about the way hotels typically run? Is there an education process required or are they open to being, let's say, educated in terms of what's required in a hotel or do they kind of just say, this is how we want to do it, we expect it to be done? Well, right. I think any intelligent person should be open to education. Agreed. Uh, but hotel owners often have an ego and often have uh, you know, their own background in making money and therefore they can afford to own a hotel. Um, so it's not easy to, to educate owners in that you know, part, but maybe we should um, start a series of educating owners online and um, you and I can set that up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the reasons why I've set Tech Talk Travel up, essentially, to yeah. be an educational platform yeah. for hotel owners as well as hoteliers and tech providers, essentially for the industry. 
So that's why I'm asking if there's that, um, if you feel that that's an important part of, of what's required. You know, over my years, I've been fortunate enough to work with a variety of owners, some more difficult than others, yeah. some very professional. Yeah. <clears throat> find out what the expectation is of that owner beforehand. Find out what they're looking for. Find out what, what you know, turns them on or not. Um, and I think keeping a close relationship with them is part of the success of not only the management company, but also of the general manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true, very true. Good. Okay, and, and just finally, Rico, from um, your perspective, given the, the breadth of your career, if you were talking with, a, a, again, a young person coming up, what would right. be three key pieces of advice that you would give uh, a graduating student coming into the industry? Yeah. How would you, what would be just the three types of advice that you could give them? Um, I think never underestimate that hotel business is hard work. You got to be dedicated to work hard, and it it doesn't mean working early hours, late nights, holidays when other people are off. Also, I think you're going to be very successful if you always say yes when somebody asks you, "Can you help? I need a volunteer." Is there somebody that always put your hand up? Always be the one that is seen as oh, that person will always help me. Stay late travel to that country and work there for a year out of a suitcase doing jobs that other people will not do um, because you learn from that and I'm, I, maybe it's my own experience I, I, I often was was doing that when I was young and um, I, I was going to countries because there was help needed here or there or uh, when you know things were busy I was helping out cleaning rooms or you know, Thanksgiving in the States, I was helping the restaurant serve, serve the customers. So, and I can still do it today because I also enjoy doing that. Um, but those are two things that always stand, stand out for me to say, these are two aspects. And then keep your, keep your focus on your dream, what you want to become. Now today, you know, when I was uh, fresh behind the ears and coming out of hotel school, I never thought I'd be a CEO of a, you know, huge uh, real estate company that happens to have beautiful hotels. Mm. But things will come on your path if you do all these things. Mm. Things come your way. Um, and I have a, a few mentees, people that I speak to regularly who ask me the same thing. You know, how can I do that? How can I do that? I, say, I don't know. Because when I was your age, I also did not know. I just happened to work hard. I always volunteered. Um, and I was a little bit lucky, I think. Yeah. The third thing is uh, you got to have some luck in your life. You do. Have a good mentor. Yeah. Have somebody that... Um, gives you an opportunity mm. um, and I've, I've had some great mentors and still do today. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a key point that one as well because it's knowing when to take the most of that opportunity as well and to, to run with it. So it's being able to, to be aware of it. As have well. patience. And that's perhaps where a mentor yeah. would help, definitely. Um, a mentor will help you, uh, you know, have patience. Where, where a young person after one year wants to, oh, I need to move on, I need to have a new job, I need to do something you know, better, um, to make more money. Um, because in the beginning, hotel business is maybe not making ends meet for them. No. It's, it's not easy. No. But I sometimes say, you know, it's like this beautiful bottle of wine. This bottle of wine is, is uh, five years old, six years old, and you want to open up and drink it. But you know in five years, it's going to be so much better. It's aged so much better. Have patience. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Rico, on that note, I think we'll, we'll, we'll finish. Thank you so much for being here. It's You're been welcome. It's fantastic having you on the show. Absolutely. We really appreciate it. Good. And, um, yeah, we'll hopefully see you again soon. I look forward to it. So um, always welcome to come here and uh, in my home here in Amsterdam. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching, um, again for watching this season. This is the final episode of season two. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, we've got some very interesting content coming up next year. So please make sure you hit the subscribe button and also the little bell next to the subscribe button so you get the notifications. And until then, I'd like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year as we move into 2019. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, through our travels next year. Until then, it's bye for now. Thanks a lot, bye bye.